it is much more dead in here than when I recorded that SLS video. So hopefully the audio is improved. Hello and welcome back. Today I am doing another video about artificial gravity. This all stems from my original video, which was a bit of a passion project. I kind of worked on it on and off. I spent 47 hours editing it, I think. Expected a few hundred views, got, well, 40,000 when I did my last follow-up, and now 300,000 something? Yeah, it's, uh, it's up there. I think if I do the math, I'm actually making more than minimum wage. And of course, with all of that attention, making it the most popular video I've made on this channel, there was a lot of comments. Now, I haven't kept up with this perfectly, but I try to read every comment. Sometimes when there's a lot of comments coming in on once, YouTube doesn't notify me, so sometimes I'll go scroll through the more recent comments, but I think I've read most of them and I've replied to a lot of them. And doing all of that has led me to notice there's a few common questions that people are bringing up. So with these common questions, I've decided to make some videos addressing them. So instead of copying and pasting myself, I can link out to the video. The first one I did was thrust-based artificial gravity, which was a pretty good explanation of why thrust-based artificial gravity wasn't really being considered in that video. But it does end on a slightly optimistic note, so that was nice. One of the other common comments is looking at short radius centrifuges, specifically hating on short radius centrifuges, which I expected. Even when I wasn't expecting many views, I knew people weren't going to like that I was a fan of short radius centrifuges, but this is not the video following up to short radius centrifuges. I don't know, I have some ideas on how I wanna do that, but I'm not really sure how to move forward. Uh, it's coming. What this video is going to be addressing is a third trend, which is sort of itself two different things, but they come back to the same idea, which is that you can't test artificial gravity on Earth. Some people say that the results are incorrect because testing on Earth adds this extra gravity, which means you're not really experiencing one G, you're experiencing the square root of two Gs. That is sort of its own issue. We try to control for everything possible and it just doesn't make sense to willy-nilly throw together a centrifuge that you know nothing about or how it's gonna work and just shoot it to the space station, which is not built to handle a giant centrifuge and, you know, just, seeing what happens. Yeah, we tend to proceed with a bit more caution in the aerospace field, so we test things on the ground, even if it's not a perfect representation. The way we do this is actually based on head down bed rest studies. So if you don't know, head down bed rest studies are a way to study zero G on Earth because there's not many astronauts in space at any given time, so they're not really a statistically significant group. So we have compared normal people to them while they're laying down in a bed that's tilted backwards, so their feet are above their head. Head down bed rest study. You basically stay in bed for six months, don't even sit up, and you have all the same bad health effects as an astronaut. Your bones get weaker, blood rushes to your head, you get stuffy, interocular pressure. Oh God, I butchered that pronunciation. Eye pressure goes up because of the fluids rushing to your head. So really it is a good analogy for being in zero G. Not perfect, but it's good. So we have this way to create zero G on earth for long lengths of time. We just stuck them in a centrifuge and spun them while they're still on their bed doing their bed rest thing and that loads the body, pulls the fluids down, puts some force on your legs, but you're still laying in a bed and you're kind of leaning backwards into the bed, not standing up perfectly because like we've mentioned, gravity does still exist. So it's pulling you back into the bed. So it's not a perfect representation of artificial gravity in space, especially because you could do exercise in space, but we found out it fixes a lot of the problems with the bed rest study. Your bones don't get as weak, your muscles don't get as weak, and your blood pressure goes back to normal levels. It seems like this is really good evidence in favor of artificial gravity, and we didn't have to launch it to space to find out. Now, based on that, we can justify spending all the money to do more research in space, which would be more relevant. But you have to understand that the testing on the ground is an important part of this, and it is not completely useless. But now we can get into the meat of this video, which is the other criticism people have about artificial gravity tests on Earth, 
and that's that they don't believe that artificial gravity will work at all in space. So this ranges from some hokey stuff where people thought that you needed to account for the gravitational pull of stars in different galaxies. Those don't really affect you. That's sort of like closing down the Golden Gate Bridge because there's been too many refrigerator magnet sales in San Francisco. The refrigerator magnets are not gonna pull your bridge down. The pull of stars in other galaxies is not going to affect your blood pressure. But other people are just genuinely trying to find out how you actually get pulled down by a centrifuge, especially if there's no gravity holding you in place when it starts spinning. One person phrased it fairly well is if you have a big cylinder and your astronaut's floating in it and you just spin that cylinder, your astronaut's gonna stay right in the same place and it's just gonna spin around them. And that is true. If you had this empty cylinder and you spun it, you wouldn't suddenly stick to the wall. But generally we don't talk about doing that with centrifuges for artificial gravity. Usually you would hold on to a handrail or something when it starts spinning so you get up to speed with it and then you're impacted by the artificial gravity. Or if you don't hold on to anything, there's probably going to be a wall somewhere where you're gonna run into it and then you'll get up to speed. To demonstrate this, let's go to KSP. KSP is a video game, but it actually has a really good physics engine for space travel. And it's just a handy sandbox tool if you wanna to throw together a really dumb idea and see what happens. So my idea was this big device, which is a tether style artificial gravity. It has some additional weights going out on the side. That's just to stabilize it because Without those, it's rotating around its intermediate axis. And if you've watched the original video, which statistically you probably have, you would know that's going to make it tumble, which is not great. So I added those for additional stability. At the top around the counterweight, there are two engines, which allow me to speed up and slow down the station. When I burn those, it just causes it to rotate. And then if we go down to the bottom, at the end of the longest arm, we have our artificial gravity chamber. And inside we have Jebediah Kerman, floating around, having a good time. Clearly, he is in zero G, he's not touching the wall, he's not holding on to anything, and if we turn on the engine, he goes flying to the side and hits the wall. But once he hits the wall, he gets up to speed, artificial gravity kicks in, and he falls to the ground. Clearly, something appears to be forcing him down onto the ground, and that's why we call it artificial gravity, because it looks like gravity. And now that he's up to speed, he can actually start moving around and he'll behave like he's in gravity. Sort of. When you turn your jetpack on, Kerbal will lock the Kerbal's orientation. That's what the astronauts are called. They're called Kerbals. They lock that orientation to vertical in the inertial frame. So the rotation doesn't know that he should be rotating, but his velocity does. But anyway, if we turn on his jetpack and fly up away from the ground, and then let go of our controls, he just falls back down. Even though he isn't touching the wall this time, he looks like he's falling more or less straight down. This becomes even more obvious if we climb a ladder instead of using the jetpack and then just let go at the top, he falls straight back down that ladder. He doesn't have to fly over and hit the wall because he's already up to speed. And because the radius of this is pretty large, the Coriolis effect isn't noticeable as he's falling down. If you don't know about the Coriolis effect, Tom Scott had a great video, but generally when you're closer to the axis of rotation, i.e. you've climbed the ladder to a higher height, you're rotating slower, not in terms of degrees per second, but in terms of meters per second tangent to the circle you're rotating around. So you're traveling at a lower speed, and that way when you let go and you fall down to the ground, the ground is moving faster than you, like, like this. So if you're locked into the ground, it looks like you sort of fall that way uh, if you're rotating this direction. I will probably just do a graphic so that it makes sense. But at our scale where you're falling like one meter and the radius is, I didn't measure, but many more than one meters, you don't notice the Coriolis effect, which is one of the benefits of large radius centrifuges. There you go, you got me to admit it. Though I will point out, on a short radius centrifuge, you wouldn't be climbing ladders and jumping. You would probably be on like an elliptical or some sort of exercise device that keeps you locked in place, but it does allow you to bear your own weight so you're not like sitting on a bike seat. And it also helps you maintain your cardio, which astronauts already do, so they might as well do it on a centrifuge. 
And because of that study I mentioned, we know you can adapt to that rotating environment and you won't get sick. Those are all the reasons I'm in favor of short radius centrifuges because that means you can just stick it inside of your ship and make it very, very small. The mass will be much less than the cable system you need to connect two starships together and the additional fuel you would need to spin those up because no, you cannot use a reaction wheel to spin up the starships because of the conservation of angular momentum. I'm going on a big rant tangent here, but basically the angular momentum is the distance from the center of rotation times the velocity and rocket engines have a very, very high velocity. So unless you make your flywheel bigger than the entire spaceship, you are going to need to move the flywheel at speeds of kilometers per second, or it's just gonna end up being heavier than the fuel. So that's why you wouldn't use a flywheel to start artificial gravity rotation. But I digress. We were talking about this little green man falling off of his ladder. To explain what's going on here, I am going to change over to an animation, which is less physically accurate because I hand animated this. It's not perfect but it's demonstrating how traveling in straight lines through space makes it look like there's gravity. So we have this little artificial gravity station and a ball floating in the middle. If we start rotating it, that ball flies to the side or rather the side flies into the ball. They impact and if we pause and zoom in, we can look at what's happening. The wall has a velocity in this direction and because the ball is crashing into it, it's going to bounce and take some of that velocity and travel in a straight line straight to the left. And this is why it still works in space and not just on Earth. That ball is traveling in a straight line. There is no gravity curving its path, but because the rotating environment is traveling around a circular path, eventually that straight line intersects with the floor. If we let the animation play, you can see it crashes into the floor, bounces again, let this play out, you eventually see what looks like bouncing from the inertial view where we're not rotating. And if you switch to the rotating view, you can clearly see that what is a straight line to an inertial observer looks like a bouncing ball to us. I think just this visual is a really good explanation of how artificial gravity works, even in space where there's nothing to hold you in place in the centrifuge. Once you're up to speed with your centrifuge, you can jump, not touch anything, and you'll still appear to fall back down. It looks like you're experiencing gravity. The studies I mentioned say it feels like you're experiencing gravity. You might as well be in gravity. That's why it's called artificial gravity. And of course, you don't have to crash into the wall to initiate this. You can just hold on to a handrail or a ladder, and once you have some velocity, you'll stick to the ground. Also, I could have mentioned this at the beginning, but we literally have a centrifuge on the ISS. It's small, it's for like fruit flies, but we use it, it works. So yes, centrifuges do work in space. So there's not much difference between artificial gravity and real gravity, except for tidal forces. And then obviously you can notice you're rotating in a rotating environment, but the gross acceleration across your body, if you stand still, is the same. And that's the important thing. No, we might not be replicating the slight tidal force of Proxima Centauri, but we are getting you very, very close to what you would feel on Earth to the point where your squishy, non-precise, evolving, adapting body is able to accept this environment and live healthily. That's what we need to accomplish. We just need to get you close enough. You know, your head can be at less than 1G and your feet can be at more, and you probably won't notice. People like to use this as the reasoning why you get dizzy or sick in a centrifuge. That's not true. Otherwise, wearing a heavy backpack or a weighted vest would make you nauseous, which it doesn't. You can sense acceleration in your ears. You can't in your feet. All you feel is pressure. So yeah, you might feel more pressure on your feet than you're used to, but you're not gonna get sick purely on the fact that there's slightly less or even a lot less gravity at your head. What matters is that on average, all of the fluid is being pulled back down and your entire skeleton is now bearing a similar amount of load and 
you're exercising so that you're, you're staying healthy. You still need to do that, sorry. With a short radius centrifuge, you're not gonna be in it all the time and you can't sleep in it. Like I said, bed rest studies replicate zero G, so sleeping in one G in zero G just means you're still in zero G health-wise. Like, it's easier to sleep in a bed in one G, but it's not gonna stop your bone loss and muscle loss and it's not gonna redistribute the fluid to the right places because you're laying down. So you still need to exercise and you're only gonna be in the thing for like 30 minutes a day, but that's plenty based on this other study that I referenced in that original video. But anyway, this is sort of veering into short radius centrifuge territory, which is going to be its own follow-up video. Please subscribe if you wanna see that. I'm Con Happy, and I'll see you in the next video.